Good morning, and welcome to this opening session for day two of Restart. <clears throat> I'm Matt Mueller, the editor of Screen International. I'm delighted to be chairing this conversation with three of the UK's most acclaimed, <clears throat> industrious, and admired producers, all of whom have been at the forefront of independent film production in the UK for several years and even decades. In recent times, they've increasingly been gaining a foothold in scripted television as well. This trio's productions have been festooned with awards. Many have become huge global box office hits, and they are among some of the most well-known and beloved British films of all time. All three of our speakers have a phenomenal list of credits to their name, and therefore it's worth running through a few past, current, and future highlights for each of them before we launch into our conversation. Let's start with Tim Bevan. Tim Bevan is co-chairman of Working Title Films, which he has been running with his business partner, Eric Fellner, since 1992. Across that nearly three decades, Working Title has been a UK-based production powerhouse feature films and television for the international marketplace. Its feature productions, which include Darkest Hour, The Theory of Everything, and Emma, have grossed over $7.5 billion worldwide and won enough Oscars, BAFTAs, and other prizes to line several cabinets, while its TV division's output includes The Luminaries, Tales of the City, and Hannah, the latter for Amazon. In collaboration with Heyday Films and Eon Productions, the company also opened the London Screen Academy in 2018 to help address skills shortages in the UK screen sectors. Upcoming projects on the working title slate include Edgar Wright's Last Night in Soho, due to be released in cinemas this fall, and further down the line, Matthew Warkus's Matilda, Lena Dunham's Catherine Called Birdie, and Old Parker's Ticket to Paradise, which will star George Clooney and Julia Roberts in a setup with the company's long-time studio Universal. Welcome, Tim. Next, we have Ian Canning. Ian is Joint Managing Director of Seesaw Films, which he founded in 2008 with Australian producing partner Emile Sherman. With offices in both London and Sydney, Seesaw has produced a raft of award-winning feature films, including 2011 Academy Award winner The King's Speech, Lion, Widows and Shane by Philip McQueen, and most recently, Francis Lee's Ammonite. The company has also in recent years put an increasing focus on television, starting with Jane Campion's Top of the Lake and its follow-up series, China Girl. Seesaw's busy slate of upcoming production includes for television, Slow Horses and the Essex Serpent, both for Apple TV+, Plus, Heartstopper for Netflix, and Andrew Hague's the, the North Water for the BBC. While on the film side, Seesaw are in post on Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog and Operation Mincemeat, and recently announced that they are partnering with Film 4, on Florian Zeller's follow-up to Oscar winner The Father, which is titled The Sun and is due to star Hugh Jackman and Laura Dern. Welcome Ian. Next, we have Alison Owen. Alison has credits including Elizabeth, Saving Mr. Banks and Suffragette, and is founder and partner in Monumental Pictures, which she and her producing partner, Deborah Hayward, launched in 2014. The company operates as both a feature film and television production house, and having partnered with ITV Studios in 2015, to form TVR Monumental Television has been increasingly focused on the latter. Monumental's teachings include three seasons of Harlots and the BBC's hit comedy series Ghosts, which has been a key focus for Alison during the pandemic, getting the second and third series across the line. But Monumental's film slate also continues to be busy, and following its most recent production, How to Build a Girl, the company is actively developing the Rebel Wilson musical Girl Group for Lionsgate, the Edith Wharton adaptation of the Buccaneers for Focus Feature. Here's the JoJo adaptation, The Giver of Stars for Universal, Longborn for Focus and Netflix, and an Amy Winehouse biopic for Studio Canal. Welcome, Alison. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, let me start with a fairly big picture question, but um, probably quite useful given the context of, of three of you as speakers. Um, given all the new platforms seeking film and content, the huge audience appetite for consuming screen content, and the fluidity that now exists between film and television. Broadly speaking, in terms of your own careers, would you say that now is one of the best times ever to be an international fiction company of scale? Should we start with you, Ian, on that one? Um, I think so, yeah. I mean, putting the pandemic to one side, I think, I think that's probably true. I, I think that um, and something we've been definitely thinking and evolving at, uh, at Seesaw is just how um, you can basically work with storytellers in the format that is the best way of telling the story. So I think, um, and it actually happened for us in terms of a big shift when we did Top of the Lake with Jen Campion, and she was sort of talking about how that show was her novel. She wanted to sort of do a novel on television. So I think 
I think the ability to be a company that is across all different sort of formats of storytelling um, makes it very exciting. So I would, I would agree with that. Um, Alison, what about for you? Yeah, well, I would agree. And I think that, that that's what Ian's just said is, is, is one of the biggest advantages is to be able to look at properties and be able to uh, allow the writers and filmmakers to construct the best possible shape for them so that they don't, you can, you can buy a book. And whereas before, if you bought a book and it was an expense, you know, it, was, it had a very wide range, you would have to encourage someone to do it as a movie because that's where you'd get the money. Whereas now it can take it if it's a picaresque novel it can be over 10 eps and that that shape can be encouraged because you can find the finance for it so i do think it's a i think i, I think it's a strange time because the landscape is now so huge it's almost impossible to have any kind of strategy but in a way that's sort of good because you're back to your first instincts and thinking look you know i i it, it's it's now so wide i can't second guess anything i can't second guess a market different platforms are it's like whack-a-mole they're coming up every day so all you can do is is, is think well this is response material and think this moves me this makes me laugh this makes me cry i'm a human being other people are human beings and they're going to respond to it too so and just put put your faith in that and that's 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 both um a little bit scary but also uh you know encouraging thank you and and tim what about for you we'll come on to talk about the pandemic but just in terms of a you know, a broader review. Do you think this is a great time? Yeah, again, again, pandemic aside, I think yeah, that that's probably right. I think the, the big thing that's happened is that the the there's been over the last five years, I think, is that there's been a migration of the key talent. So directors, actors, writers are happy to work in either medium, and that certainly wasn't the case. You know five years ago is that there was a sort of snobbery about movies but you know thanks to thanks to the streamers and thanks to what's happened with well it was premium cable that really started it is that television is no longer i mean it is absolutely equal if not ahead of the of the cinema experience and i think that you know many of the films that working title would have made as as movies like 10 20 years ago uh probably better off in uh in television and it gives you know gives the filmmakers a a longer period to develop character and story and, and all the rest of it um you know i think probably what we're all a little bit concerned about at the moment is where cinema actually goes um and 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 what's going to happen there you know because certainly eric and i both came into the business because we wanted to make movies um and you know whether whether that's going to be the case in 10 years time i don't know <clears throat> well, we'll come on and uh, to talk about that a little bit more later on, but I just wanted to, um, as, as you referenced, uh, talk a little bit about the pandemic and, and, and maybe look at how each of your companies navigated um, the last year, you know, what, what both in terms of, you know, keeping your companies stabilized, but also in terms of productions that you either had to cancel altogether or we, we had to cancel temporarily and then we're able to um, later on on once the sort of COVID protocols were in place. Um, so I wonder if you could each just give me a, a give us a, a little overview of, of, of that and how that last year was for you. I mean, Tim, do you want to start with that one? Sure. Yeah, is that uh, um, thanks to my partner, we've had probably the busiest, busiest year that we've had for, for a long time. I mean, in the in the first lockdown, uh, we had to stop production on two movies on uh, Lena Dunham's movie Birdie and on Swimmers and we were in pre-pre-production on, on Matilda um, and actually during the first lockdown what happened which is something that hasn't we always <coughs> as a company try to have a weekly production meeting and a weekly development meeting which inevitably get cancelled because one of us isn't able to attend it but actually we were able to attend them on, on Zoom and actually our, our development slate got very cleaned up because of that um, but then uh, during that time a film came together with MGM which we shot last autumn which was uh, Joe Wright's Serrano um, and then this year we've been very busy uh, we shot one film for Studio Canal we're in production on Matilda we've shot Birdie and we're shooting Swimmers and we've got a couple of other films in pre-production is that the the basically our production department are probably busier than ever because of the covid protocols and all the rest of it and there are all these new experts on film sets which seem to be very expensive who are covid experts 
uh, and the whole thing is is a bit bit crazy but it's it's uh and very expensive um so so it's meant that the smaller films it's very difficult to get them get them done um but i think it's settling down now and, and that really the protocol obviously everyone needs to be safe on a film set and that what we're learning is that the protocols the official protocols the union protocols which are what drove it the sag and dga protocols are probably a little over rigorous and that one can can navigate around them and each film has its own 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 issues you know ticket to paradise we're just going to go to australia which i'm sure ian's doing on a number of productions and you can ignore the whole thing um, but yeah all, all in all you know production's back uh whether distribution in the cinema's back or not uh we, we, we wait to see um and obviously distribution on on, on television has had, had a phenomenal year I think you mentioned, Tim, that two of the projects that you um, suspended for the pandemic, you ended up setting up elsewhere. Setting up elsewhere. Yeah, that's right. It's both Swimmers and Birdie is what they were going to be focus movies. And and for various reasons that, that they 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 elected not to to continue with them. And we set them up. In fact, one with Netflix and one with one with Amazon. So, um, yeah, happy, a, a happy story there. I mean, the thing is that production sort of nuts i'm sure we're going to go on to talk about this in a minute but there's the, the, what's happened there's been this instant start and no, normally everything gets staggered so that the production runs over uh, properly around the year but because everyone's starting at the same time the the, the there's incredible skill shortages and it's incredibly busy there's no studios etc 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 but i'm sure we'll get on to discuss that in a minute um shall we come to you next in terms of uh how the last year was for you and uh, what, what you, you know, how you responded and what, what you've been able to get back into production this year. Sorry, to me, is that to me or to Ian? No, that was for Ian initially, and then we'll come to you, Alison, if that's okay. Um, I, I, I think when the sort of blind panic sort of ended slightly and um, it, it, it it was a really sort of crazy time. We had a we had a last segment of Andrew Haig's North Water shooting in Northern Canada um, when the first lockdown happened. We had uh, Power of the Dog shooting um, in New Zealand, um, and we had just finished shooting Operation Mincemeat um, in Spain. So we had to uh, deal with a lot of furloughing dynamics on Operation Mincemeat. We had to shut down. Um, the Andrew Haig shoot in Northern Canada and bring everybody back. And then also we, we, we shut down Power of the Dog slightly later because uh, New Zealand went into lockdown slightly later than the UK. And then we were lucky because of having that kind of two sides of, of the world production that Power of the Dog was able to start back up pretty quickly and, and finish the shoot. Um, we were already in post on Operation Mincemeat, so it was just about organising that. And then Northwater, we had to wait until um, the world had slightly righted itself again to, to be able to, to finish that show. Um, and then we were in, um, you know, very much supported by Apple. We were in a sort of long pre-pre on Slow Horses and Essex Serpent, and they really supported that process and keeping all of the, the crew um, connected and on those projects so that as soon as things um were organized in terms of the protocols we were able to to be the first back up so it was um it was all of that side of that with and our production team with nikki earnshaw was sort of working around the clock to, to to organize all of that but also it sort of i felt for writers during that period of time because the one thing they want to be is left alone and i think the whole producing community decided that writers were the only people they could call um to justify their existence so um it was a, probably a bonanza time for writers, but also quite distressing because we were suddenly all on the phone and very quick with our notes. Thanks, Ian. And Alison, how about you? How was the, I know you were busy with the, your uh, successful BBC series, Ghosts. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the focus that you put yeah. on that during, during the pandemic? Yeah, we were just lucky, really, in terms of timing. It wasn't by design. We we. We literally f finished shooting uh, series two of Ghosts on the Wednesday before the, and I remember that the lockdown started on the Friday. And we had to pull a tiny bit of shooting forward, but otherwise we just finished it, got it in the can, and then took all the uh, post, you know, got the stuff, the equipment into the editors' homes rather than being in the West End so that they could continue editing at home and we could just deliver each episode as it came. And then went straight into 
the writer's room for series three, which we could do on, on Zoom, as everybody does now. And um, and we had the American version of Ghosts, which we managed to, which, which started shooting just in the in, in the middle of the American lockdowns as well, which we were able to do exactly when it was supposed to be on time. So we didn't have to rearrange anything. And then the, uh, we had a, a movie that got shunted because the COVID costs got too expensive. So I guess we were affected by that. And also we're doing a series called Murder in Provence, which we were going to shoot a lot in France. And um, because of COVID, we've had to move most of it back to and do all the interiors and, and some of the exteriors here, which we're, we're in pre-production for now and just hoping, fingers crossed, we'll be able to, to scoot over and do the um, do some exteriors in September in France, hoping everything will be clearer by then. So, so yeah, we just sort of ploughed on really. And, and, and it's, uh, we were lucky with Ghosts because it was on series, it was series two. So by the, time we sh by the time we came to shoot series three in January with all the COVID protocols, everybody was very familiar with each other. So on a third series and something that's more contained, it's much easier than, than starting something new. Yes, and I'm sure, uh, you know, moving location person also, you know, having to factor in COVID protocols has obviously been a, been a huge factor for all of your productions. So maybe we could talk a little bit more about that. I mean, Tim, you touched on that, but um, I mean, we, one of the sessions yesterday threw up the, the rather sort of, um, uh, incredible number that apparently the COVID team on Martin Scorsese's new production is up, is a people. Um, and that, uh, you know, obviously it's a, it's huge, a huge production It's shooting in the States. And so, you know, probably has, there's more rigorous controls perhaps, but I wonder if you could each talk about how factoring that into the budgets and the whole kind of COVID protocols as they exist, I mean, how, how you're working with those and you know, how helpful they've been, what, what, you know, what do you think of, do you think, when do you think it's time to sort of maybe dissipate them going forward? What are your thoughts on, on the existing protocols? A rip off. Uh, Tim, do you want to start with that one? Uh, they're, they, they're, uh, horrendously expensive and, um, that you've got to believe that somebody somewhere is making a lot of money out of this, uh, pandemic, particularly uh, around movie sets. Um, uh, but you know, you need to keep everybody safe and, and that, um, you don't want COVID to, to, to stop you. So I think on, on all of our productions, it's that they found their own feet as it were, in terms of the way of, of, of dealing with it, you know, obviously something like Matilda, which in fact, Eric's covering, you know, you've got a lot of kids, you got a lot, and, and there's a massive protocol on that because there, there are so many people, um, on Lena's film, we were lucky. We were on a on a location away from London that was isolated, and and one could really control who who came and went. I think one of the strange things that's happened is that that there's this there's a protocol there's a COVID supervisor on each set, and it seems to me that that actually films and television uh, in their, in their, in their, in their sort of management are pretty well structured to to deal with incidents like covid and actually the the film structure itself which is the production manager and all the rest of it should really be the the way that the whole thing's dealt with so there's this odd sort of dual dual when 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 for instance when when somebody somewhere tests positive there's this odd, odd dual um hierarchy about the whole thing so 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 it's complicated it's just another issue that we have to sort out basically and i guess because because making films and making television, you know, is that, that I, I, I remember somebody saying that, that if, if, if they need something complicated done, they either go to somebody who's worked in the film industry or somebody who's worked in the army, because we're used to standing in the middle of a field with nobody around and nothing there and a city emerging, uh, six weeks later with three or 400 people making a film. So it's just, it's just another issue basically, um, that we have to, we have to deal with, but it is, horrifically expensive at the moment and that that needs to be brought down um ian would you like to add any thoughts to that yeah i mean it was i mean initially um and never what you know it was it was also making sure everyone felt safe and and um you know hopeful and back coming coming back to work in those early days but it, it did feel in the in the very early days like you were sort of walking through the sort of third act of et with the tents and the and the you know it, it had that real 
kind of feeling to it. I think it's sort of slightly come down. It, it's incredibly expensive. You have to make a judgment call on film in particular about whether you are worth, whether it's worth because of the enhanced nature of the budget with all of the um, protocols, is it worth taking the risk on the film being substandard because you're never going to be able to get to make that film again? So we would not have been able to make the King's Speech during this period of time. The, 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 the difference of the, the COVID costs um, on top of the budget would have, would, have, would have taken the whole production value out of the, um, out of the production. So I, I, I think it's, it's a very, very complicated um, moment for independent films that have some um, scale or ambition to them, um, especially if they're being made independently. So, so I, I think that's, um, that's our biggest concern at, at, at the moment. I think television um, and all of the work with the streamers is incredibly strong and um, we're, you know, playing our part in that with Heartstopper and, and, and the Apple shows. But independent film is, is um, it's a very particular film that I think can be made and be able to cope with the additional costs. Yeah, that's a very um, fragile sector anyway. Without without the challenges of you know the additional cost, and I you know that's obviously you know very difficult for, for the producers and you know trying to sort of get process off the ground in, in that space. Um, Alison, do you have any particular thoughts on the on the COVID sort of side of things? I mean, how was how were things on the uh, third series of um, Ghosts when you shot? Well, Ghost was pretty easy to, to, to maintain and contain because of it, because it was a show that we'd done, already done two series of. But, but as Tim said, it, there's, you know, it's trying to sort out the box ticking from the, from the common sense that's irritating. Because you know, sometimes you're finding you're spending money on things that actually you know are not particularly, or there's some, you know, some shyster has set them up as some COVID expert and just to fill out the forms, you've got to pick it rather than, rather than doing things that you actually know are needed to keep people safe. So, but that's all you sort of, you just navigate your way through that. The financing of it is the, has been the challenging part because in general, I think it's, it's added about 20% to the costs of feature films and about 10, between 10 and, and 12 on, on TV. And of course the, you, the challenge is figuring out who's going to pay for that because the people that you're selling to in a marketplace, you know, Taiwan is not going to pay any extra for a movie or a TV series because you've covered your COVID costs. They're going to pay exactly the same price as they always want to pay. And so to figure out how that's going to be um, covered and apportioned pro rata between your financiers was tricky at the beginning. I think it's there's, there's a sort of a, a accepted a formula now that's made it easier. But it's frustrating. I find the the movies is frustrating because you sort of know it's not really 20% and there's ways of getting that down. But a lot of the time with studios, you're not allowed to do that because it has to follow a certain formula that, that, that um, someone in California has decided is the formula that you've got to follow. And that's, that's frustrating. And, and I would agree with Ian that it's those kind of king speech sized films that have suffered the most because the bigger movies, big, huge action movies, superhero movies, people will just chuck money at because they need to get the, they need the product and they need to get it out. And the tiny little films, you know, ingenious young producers will always find a way to do it. If they're, you know, a million or under or something, they, they, they can manage to do it. But it's those sort of 10 to $15 million movies that have, where the, the um, you know, the, the economic dynamics just don't work in terms of absorbing those extra costs. So that's been, that they've been the victims mostly of a, of a break in production. Yeah, and you mentioned the large scale films. I mean, Tim, you, you mentioned uh, uh, potentially taking a ticket to paradise to Australia. Was that was that uh, is that a serious consideration? Given you know that you'll have a bit more well freedom down. Yeah, given that it's set in Bali, we weren't going to shoot it in Shropshire. Um, so <laughs> Australia probably would have always been the place that we went to uh, with that film. Uh, you know, because and, and you know, I think the other thing that we haven't talked about is borders are the enemy of of of, of getting people across borders has just been a, a nightmare basically, and and so so we're lucky here in the UK because we've got great crew. You know, we're 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 sort of self-contained with the exception of bringing some talent in, but any border is a real issue with with COVID. I mean, you can see that 
you know, in 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 the world generally, but it, it's accentuated on a movie, I think. Um, yeah, I guess everyone's looking for where where you know where you can go, where you can go, and where you can do it for less money. It's a long and short of it. It's the same old thing with a new set of problems. Yeah, is it, Tim? Is it right that you have a COVID-driven project that you created during the pandemic? No. Was that <laughs> oh, okay? I thought you had a okay. Never mind. Um... I can't think of anything worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about the um, uh, just the you know the, the competition-defined projects in the in the current marketplace. I mean, given there are obviously all these new very large streaming companies who are hungry for content um, alongside the existing, you know, legacy studios and other companies. Uh, is there, is it, is it harder to find the good, the good books, the good kind of pieces of materials of IT that IP that you want to turn into film or television projects? I mean, how do you, do you sort of see a more heated kind of market for, acquiring book rights or acquiring, you know, or finding writers for projects. What's the, what's the situation there? Is that, has that changed re in, at all in, in sort of recent times? Ian, do you want to start with that one? Um, I think good books have always been competitive. Um, I think probably it's a bit more so now because you get to um, pick the medium that you're going to um, adapt into. But um, I, I think that the, exciting aspects of um, the streamers coming in is is that actually the same set of, of writers getting commissioned over and over again and production companies not being able to launch new voices um, has really shifted I think I think it shifted um, in a really good way so that I think you can with the with the right idea sort of take a risk um, on, on a new writer and develop them and then um, uh, get get into the sort of marketplace and get commissioned probably in a way that you couldn't before because everyone was deeply uh, trying to get relationships with the five or six writers that were always going to get commissioned. So I think, I think that shift, I think it has got competitive in terms of IP massively, but I think there is opportunities with taking risks on new writers and new storytellers, which I think sort of balances out those two things. Yeah, I think the, I think the uh, slight Americanization of the systems helped in that respect too, because as, you know, you wouldn't have had a writer's room in on a TV show in the UK five to five years plus ago, whereas that's happening a lot now. And it's, it's great for bringing on new, I agree, would agree with Ian, that's great for bringing on new talent. I also agree. It's, it's always been competitive chasing down a down a down a, a book or a, a big piece of IP, and that's just that's part of the game, um, you know. And it's the eight, I think the agents are having a bit of a field day with it um, because it's, you know the the streamers are driving the prices up, but you always have to be you have to be deft. <laughs> Alison, you mentioned writers' rooms on on ghosts. Is that uh, is that a new experience for you, working in a writer's room or having a writer's room on a series that you produced? Um, well, no, with Heart, we did three series of Harlots and that was that we, we had a, a very flourishing writer's room, but that was obviously in real life, in our office, was, we, we devoted the the, uh, the basement to the writer's room. So that was about three or four years of writer's rooms on Harlots. So it, it was quite easy to transfer that system to Zoom. Um, but I would, yeah, I mean, the writers' rooms are great because also it, it's it's another way of dealing with the shortage of writers. As Ian was saying, you know, there used to be this kind of a hierarchy of just a few writers that were commissionable, but now um, that that's much much broader. But there's still an incredible shortage of writers, and sometimes you have to wait for. You know, I, I optioned a book a, a year and a half ago that was a fantastic book, and I was really happy to get it. But it's taken me. A, you know another year and a half to find the right writer and to wait for that availability so you'll have to constantly ask yourself that question do you want it do you want it you know do you want it good or do you want it quick um and the answer has always got to be good rather than quick really preferably both but sometimes sometimes you get lucky but 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 often you find yourself waiting for, for the writer's availability because there's so few but writers rooms help that because 
you can you, you, because you can bring some younger writers up you can you know the more experienced writers will install themselves as showrunners and then you're constantly training new blood to come through that, that, that can then take over on on a second and third series which is so helpful and um coming out of the pandemic i mean are you are each of you focusing on different kinds of projects that you would have before? Uh, I mean, are you looking at different genres or are the, are the people, you know, where you try to set projects up? I mean, are they asking for different kinds of projects? Is there is there a desire for lighter material at the moment coming out of the pandemic? Do you think, you know, or, you know, do you think darker material will still be popular or do you see a, do you sort of see a shift at all in the next sort of few years as we emerge from the pandemic? Um, Tim, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's fairly obvious that, you, that people want a bit of escapism at the moment. So, so setting up lighter material is probably easy. I, I don't think there'll be any great big trend. I mean, it's it's, it's really whether it's good or not. Um, and and I think it's that's that's the challenge. And it doesn't really matter whether it's dark, light, or whatever. It's it's got to be good. And that, that it's it's for us. It's always about trying to get that quality. Um, and Actually, I don't think the pandemic probably makes that much difference to that to that basic basic rule. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's it's yeah, same as usual. <laughs> you've, got, you've got a lot of musicals coming through there, haven't you? I mean, I know. Yeah, the, Eric like Eric Eric likes his musical. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of musicals. That, yeah, and there's some rom romantic comedies and stuff. But on the slate, there's all sorts of there's all sorts of uh, all sorts of material it's i mean one i think one of the issues of there being no um less low budget filmage going on is that actually where you know there's there's lots of opportunity for writers there's a lot of opportunity for directors but there's not a lot of opportunity for individual directorial voices i would say is that because a lot of directors are getting a, a, a uh, coming on and being evolved through working on TV shows and all the rest of it. And there's less room for the real individual British filmmaking voice there. And that's something that I, you know, I hope hasn't gone forever and that people d do emerge and, and, they, and they always do. But, you know, the, the, the loaches and people like that, are we and the freers, are we going to have filmmakers like that in the future who've really expressed themselves on films? individual films from quite a young age that's 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 a little bit of a worry to me um maybe may, maybe they're all out there we have a, a question in the maybe you you guys are working maybe ian and allison are working with them <laughs> yes are you are you ian and allison are you working with the next ken loach uh well i i i hope we're working with filmmakers that have a sort of career journey i mean i think that we definitely set up the business on um, building relationships with, with filmmakers in the sort of alter space and then following their voice. And I still think that people want, um, want that, but, but I agree also that the, um, the television side is going to provide a different route in for people. So it'll be interesting over the next five years, you know, with the Emerald Fennells and people coming through is, is that move from television into film, um, and a whole new generation coming out through that. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think that'll be it. That'll be it. that'll be interesting. I think in terms of comedies or you know changing the slate, I, I think it's it, I think it's very tricky. I think if you're in production on on something now that is um, uplifting, then you might be able to catch that kind of hopefully return to the cinema euphoria um, and and really capture that. And hopefully, I'm sure there's some producers who have got that type of film ready to go who. Um, are very excited about that moment. But I think trying to track that, given how long it takes to make a film and post and, and, and get it out into the world, I, I think if you were trying to capture the post-COVID trend in development, you might find that you're way past that by the time you're actually making uh, that film. Yeah, we've got a few good questions in the um, Q&A box. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to some of these. Uh, one is kind of related to what we're talking about now. and and it asks what can the industry do to help support and create a new generation of film writers i mean i would say film writers yeah i mean that's that seems a uh, a good question given you know given what we're all saying about you know 
potentially where is film going from here? You know, what's going to happen with cinemas? I mean, what do you, do any of you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think we've got quite a good support in the in in the UK. We've got you know F Film Four, BBC, and the BFI all provide good routes for for film writers, and we've always had that that infrastructure that's so much better than than anything that's like, uh, that's in the US. I've always been the envy of my producing counterparts in the US, and that that you know there's a way to develop younger writers and new talent, and and that 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 is often lacking over there. But I do think it's uh, what Tim was just saying about. You know, the, the, the auteurs of the future, I think, is something that really does need an, an eye on because it, the, 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 the thing that's always existed for the UK, which is the good news is we share a language with America, the bad news is we share a language with America, has, is, is becoming exacerbated by, 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 by the advent of streamers and, and the TV landscape. And that, that because we share a language with America, there's not a sort of natural protectionism that you might get if you were France or Germany or, or, or Scandi territories where the, there's a sort of uh, it, always a, 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 a desire to, to protect the kind of local, um, the local culture. So I, th I think we really need to be circumspect about protecting um, those auteur directors like Ken Loach and Stephen Grace coming up and not having their voices diluted because, because of, of the Americanization of the culture. Yeah, Tim Maria, yeah, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's our duty as senior producers to, to, uh, protect entry level at all at all areas i mean which is why um we started the school is that i think it, to to spread the load to diversify in terms of the sorts of people who are working in the industry at, at all levels and the voices that we're hearing i think it's 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 in all of our interest to do that and we're in a we're in a growth industry um uh thanks to everything that we've been talking about i mean and just to pick up on what alison was saying i think one of the it's quite important that we slightly divide the industry in, in, in the UK because actually we've become the Hollywood of, of this side of the, of the Atlantic, thanks to our tax credit and studios and crews and all the rest of it. But they're, they're mainly non-British cultural productions that are filling those studios, is that they're, they're, they're all sorts of studio for big, big studio films, big um, big TV shows and all the rest of it. And then amongst that, it's really important that we protect our, our, our island voices, as it were, and make sure that our, our culture is, is reflected there and that we bring, our, bring on writers and directors. But I think as producers, that's what, that's what we've, all, we, we, we've all done in our careers as we've, 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 we've evolved that. Is that. And I'm with Alison, I think there is, there is opportunity for writing here. And I think television's really, really helped that. That that like anything in in film, you do, you you know whoever asks that, pose that question is you just have to go on bashing on the door, and then one day the door opens and you're in basically. Um, uh, and, and and there's a lot of opportunity right now. There's a, there is definitely a skill shortage in writing because it's so much in production. Yeah, can you um, also all talk a little bit about your uh, the fact that you all you all have moved um well i mean i i suppose particularly alison and ian you've moved um more into scripted television uh in recent years i mean that's come on for both of you significantly um so i would you know i don't know if you see yourself you know you, you probably both would say you started out as film producers and now you're very much involved in scripted television content can you talk a little bit about the transition is that just reacting to the market so what, what what how was that how did that change come for both of you? I mean, Alison, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I mean, I've always worked in, in, in film and television, and I would say that, um, you know, I'm, I've always been a lover of story rather than film. I, 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 I love film, but I'm not someone who, who is, 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 you know, always, you know, the smell of the celluloid, the darkened theatre, uh, you know, the, the, the collective experience. I, I like that, but, but that's not what drove me into making films. I, I came into films because I love story and I love books and I love reading. And when I first came into it, film was the exciting place to be. But as if, if, te if television, if, if there was a television opportunity for something, you know, I did, I did, um, 
a series called Small Island that that you know won international Emmys and stuff like 15 years ago. I did Temple Grandin for HBO. When things fitted the TV space, I was always quite willing to go there. Anyway, the thing that used to frustrate me about television was that in the UK there were only sort of three or four places to go. So if you're a tenacious person like we all are, it's very irritating to develop something and. Uh, and once a couple of people have said no, you you have to drop the project. So that's what put me off was with film. You can, you know, if you if you're passionate about something and you want to make it, you just carry on and on and on and on and on and on until you find the right slot and the right the, the right economic um, math that that will work to do it. Whereas that was not the case with television. If 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 if, if BBC said no and ITV said no, you were kind of like, all right, got to give up then. And um, Whereas now it's not now. There's endless places to go for television, so it's great again. Like you can, you know, you can option a book, and you're like, okay, there's a million places I can think of that I can take it to um, before I've even, you know, started to get it. So, so, so for me, the transition was. I, I didn't even know if it was a transition, really. I think it was something I was always doing. It was more. It's more weight, my work was more weighted on movies and a bit of television, and that that balance has changed, but. Um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a, a really a really welcome change, and it's not it's not by again it's just it's just reacting to the opportunities rather than by any kind of strategy. Yeah, for Ian, I was I don't know if you agree with this. I think it's a bit more noted the fact that you know you were film initially, and now you have very much you know moved it moved heavily into television with with Seesaw. Yeah, I think in hindsight we would sort of look back and go, it was it was pretty crazy to to not see ourselves at, uh, as a film and television company from from the very beginning but to Alison's point I think I think it's true that there was a sort of uh, a cultural uh, difference with the idea of if you love something you, you'll be able to push it and drive it till it happens and I, I think it was such a small uh, spectrum of taste um, and it was a, a, a small um, spectrum of, of green lights um, out of the UK and I think as the market has grown and there's been other players coming in you are able to sort of apply what has historically been a film producer mentality um, to a project you love. Um, it was always so frightening to me that you would maybe send it to four people and they would say no and then that would be the end of that journey that just seems so counter to to how you um, how you get things made in the, in the film world. So, so, and I think also the the spectrum of television, the way stories are being told, the way they're backing authors in television, it, it's it's completely shifted. And and I, I I felt very much around the time of of making our first TV show, which was was Top of the Lake, um, this sort of sense of film producers rushing towards television. And I bet for everybody who was in television, it was sort of drove them drove them crazy. It it, it just um, it, the culture changed the storytellers became the same and and i think it just evolved um and and it's and it's a proper business and so you can um you, you can build your company through making television too so it's um whereas film you're reinventing the wheel every single time unless you're making sequels within the independent sector you're you're you're, you're making a new company every single time you're making a film um and in television, you don't have to do that if you get a returning series and you can explore those characters even further. So um, I think the whole the whole setup of making television changed. Mm. Tim, is there anything plus you want to add? Make, plus all of a sudden you can make money out of it too. <laughs> Helps. <laughs> well, here's, here's a question from the audience, which uh, is looking more, I suppose, at the, um, the cinema side of things, but what would you prefer to have and what would be most profitable for you? Netflix's most popular TV show or a hit film at the box office? Well, a hit film at the box office, undoubtedly, right. because, because the, problem, the problem is you sell yourself out. So, so if, and a hit film at the box office has a tail because that, because that's the other thing that, 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 that we don't really know yet is, but streams, it seems to me is that there's a, inherently quite short life on any project whereas a hit film at the box office it ascends for quite a long time it stays there for quite a long time and then it stays around for years and years and years so 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 you know had one made 
Love Actually as a as a streaming movie and sold it to Netflix, you'd kill yourself every Christmas, basically, as they re-showed it and gave you nothing. Whereas, um, uh, whereas uh, because it was made as a movie, that's not the case. Ian, that'd be my that'd be me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I think that's true. You. You've got to sort of make, um, you know, depending on what your offers are, because there might be just one place of actually making it. But yeah, that, that, um, that's usually the case. <laughs> <laughs> Dep depending on what your offers are, um, and you know, we we have definitely. I, I think it's a mixed economy now, and that's a w wonderful thing. And I think it sort of always has been between a studio film or an independent film or you know in that that sort of setup so but i um i love the independent distributors and that, that side of um the business who have sort of loved cinema from from the 60s and different um, members of the family have taken over that love of cinema and all of that sort of stuff that that side of that and seeing seeing those independents making money from films and therefore you making money from films is is really wonderful um, and I really worry about them, you know, um, surviving through all of this and um, because they really do love films and love cinema and um, it's, uh, it's, it's a troubling time for them. So, uh, so I think, yes, it, it's, it's great to have a box office here and, and be able to know that that box office is therefore somehow going to trickle down to you someday, at least part of it. Yeah, I mean, Ian, for you, you you still very you still very actively involved in pre sales market, you know, in terms of setting up projects, and that's you know very much working with you know, distribution partners around the world. But um, yeah, what do you, I mean? What do you think about the long term future of that as a business model? Um, I hope they can hang in there. Um, I, I really do, and I hope there's. Uh, a real exciting moment in terms of people coming back to the cinema but i also you also know that the the, the cinema chains have had a tough the toughest time and they're going to have to um fill the the cinemas with blockbusters in order to to, to make money so i think i think there's going to be there's going to be no room as well for for some independent films for a little while um i mean we'll we'll we're lucky that in a weird way, cinemas have opened and we've been able to release Ammonite in the cinemas in the UK uh, this week, you know, having gone on a, a sort of roller coaster of a theatrical release plan with Lionsgate, but they sort of stuck in there and then we went to premium rental and now we're, we're going back in or well, starting in the cinemas later. So that we feel like there's a little window now for for the Nomad Lands and the, and the Ammonites um, and then and then the cinemas are going to have to make some money. The, the models changed forever. I mean, you know, with the, and as somebody said at the beginning of the pandemic is that this has accelerated the future and as it has in every industry, basically. And with, you know, with the major studios pivoting to SVOD being their, their, their engine room rather than theatrical, who knows what, what the worldwide fallout of that is over the coming years. And, and, and within the pandemic too, the whole Windows thing has changed. So, so th th definitely, we're, we're returning to a very different landscape in terms of cinema going, and it's going to be very interesting to see how it all, how 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 the consumer responds and comes whether and, and what numbers they come back to the to the cinema in, but also how the new economic models work as well. Do you think there is opportunity in uh, multi-platform multi releases going forward? I mean, streaming and cinema coming together in, in a way that maybe works, you know, to the benefit yeah, of think, both. That's, yeah, that's I think a, it's been a convergence because, because of the windows, the theatrical windows being, you know, reducing from the studio's point of view, there's a convergence between the stream and the stream is allowing some sort of theatrical release. There's been an odd convergence going on. So it's going to be interesting to see. It'll come ultimately. It'll come down to economics. It, it's what is what, what you how you can squeeze the most money out of it. I think is what is what it'll be. Sadly, do you, um, for instance, with with Rebecca, which you made for Netflix? I mean, do you, you know, you mentioned obviously you don't, you know, that's a, that's a sort of one-off deal with the company. I mean, do they share viewing figures with you? And and yeah, but it... yes, they do. They do. Whether you yeah. believe them or not is who knows. Is it? <laughs> is 
Uh, I don't know. Do you do you believe the numbers that the streamers give you, Ian? Um, <laughs> getting them, I think, is is feels like a win. So that's yeah. It's your heart, yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Is that is that kind of transparency not um, beneficial to everyone in the industry though? Because it's really about, I mean, maybe they, they don't care, but I mean, don't you want to know what kind of projects audiences are responding to? That's obviously where you know, obviously box office and awards and all that kind of stuff, you know, plays a huge part. But when you're sort of producing things for platforms where you don't really know what kind of reaction, or or it's harder to gauge, I suppose, what kind of reaction there is to a project, is that frustrating? Well, maybe, maybe with, I mean, I, I think the, um, the acquisition teams at the different streamers in film are pretty honest about, um, what they're looking for and how that evolves over, over the years. Um, I mean, without the sort of festivals and infrastructure, um, in place for the last year, it's all been about getting those zooms in and hearing all of, all of, all of that side, there's not the kind of natural social aspect of the dynamic of bumping into somebody in Toronto and them sort of talking about what they're looking for. Um, but I think in terms of television, you get recommissioned. That's how, you know, it's, uh, you know, you get another series. That's how, you know, it's, it's, it's truly been a hit. Um, and if you get beyond series three, you know, you've really got something special, you know, if you get past two into three. Hmm. That's more, that's more unusual with the um, likes of Netflix, isn't it? To get, to get several series or seems to be the case. Um, would you say, um, the scale of productions, this is an audience question, the scale of productions is changing in terms of, um, both the size of a cast and, you know, in terms of people, the number of people you can have in a crowd scene. I mean, obviously that would be the case during COVID. Is this something that you think might, might last or are there any, um, are there any in impacts from COVID or the pandemic that you think will linger in terms of production? Tim, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I don't think so. The film set, oh. film set pretty much looks like a film set to me. I mean, it never ceases to amaze me for, for a sort of cutting edge industry, how intense labor intensive we are and how many people it takes on a film set and how, and, and all the rest of it. And, and, and one would have thought actually this was an opportunity to get rid of some of that, but it doesn't seem to have happened at all. But it never seems to happen, does it? I mean, whenever no. you take someone to visit the film set, they are, the two questions people always ask is what, what are all these people doing and why does it yeah. take so long? And yeah. uh, you never really feel equipped to be able to explain to that. To so yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have noticed as, as a sort of separate thing, I have noticed in reviews of television and recently the sort of you can clearly see this was made in in the pandemic and i sort of think god if you could understand what a challenge it was to you know the people that were first out making the shows it's yeah. like everyone should be applauding that effort it was it was incredible um and yeah seeing that in reviews i'm like god you don't understand to get eight people into a scene at that point um was a real achievement so it's funny it's funny seeing that in the reviews and sort of knowing you know, what it took to get us back to work. Um, we have a question about, um, uh, finding new talent, uh, sourcing new talent. Um, one, what one person is asking, uh, no one accepts unsolicited, unsolicited work. What route would the panel suggest a new writer to take to get their work seen? Are there any options out there that you can, that you can share or suggest? Alison, any thoughts on that one? Um, I have thoughts, but they're not very original ones. I would say get an agent, you know, because that's that that's the way the industry works. Is that we don't accept unsolicited scripts simply because we haven't. There's not enough hours in the day to do that, so we we rely on the next echelon, which is eight tried and trusted agents with whom we've got great relationships who do read unsolicited scripts, and you know we'll 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 sort the wheat from the chaff and find. The, the, the really great up and coming people. And once, you know, if someone, if, if an agent sends me a script saying this, you know, this person's had nothing made, this is something they wrote in their bedroom, but I think it's great, will you have a read? Yeah, I'd be, not only would I have a read, I'd be really excited to have a read. And, um, you know, I would get to it really quickly, but you do need that. 
if, if I was to read all the unsolicited scripts that got sent, I would never be making any films or TV series because that's all I would be doing. So I would, you know, my advice would be to, to, you know, yeah, just keep at it and keep sending your stuff to all the agents, you know, uh, until someone uh, recognizes um, the talent and takes it on. Is that the same advice the, uh, you would give Ian and Tim? Yeah, I, would agree. I think so. And, and, and most, um, most organizations have schemes for, for new writers as well now. So, so I, I think it's searching out those new writer, um, schemes and opportunities and workshops, but yeah, it's very competitive for agents to find those writers now. So if, if you, if there's uh, a spark of talent that they can help evolve and then get to us, I, I think there's the appetite there. Yeah. Um, Another question from uh, the viewers. Does the panel believe that the economic pressures created by COVID could force more consolidation in the independent film sector, mergers of companies to create greater scale? And would that be a good thing? Do you have any thoughts on that, Ian? I think it's, it's sort of happening or, um, I mean, I, I think in terms of films, uh, the dynamics of the UK distribution scene have, have, have very much changed in the last sort of 18 months. Um, so, so I'm not so, um, I, I think there will be consolidation, but I, I think that's inevitable. It's been such a sort of traumatic moment for the industry. Um, there are going to be some changes. I just don't know what changes exactly are going to happen because what I thought was happening in the industry last week is changing this week. So yeah. we're just going to have to ride it out a little bit. Yeah. Given that it's happening right at the top of the industry, starting with Fox Disney and now Discovery Warners and um, Amazon MGM. So one's got to believe that that's going to trickle down and that there is some form of consolidation. Are there benefits to that for the industry or what do you have a view on, on these mega mergers that are taking place? Um, uh, wait and see, I guess. <laughs> it, it it's, it, well, it, yeah, it's, is in a way it's a problem because there are less buyers at that level, you know, when, when those big companies start to consolidate and also they start to want to buy from themselves. So I think if, as independents, it's probably, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not that great, but, but there again is, I, I've always believed that, you know, the reason Eric and I went into partnership originally is that we felt that we could cover more ground together basically. And I think that that's proven to be true. And I think, that, that we all work in partnerships in actual fact, all, all, all three of us. And, that, and that's probably the same reason for, for everyone is that, that one and one equals a bit more than two somehow. And I thought, so, so yeah, consolidation is a good thing. Um, we don't have too much time left, but I just wanted to talk a little bit, I guess, to, to close just, uh, with the, um, opportunities that exist in television now, um, you all have obviously TV projects and film projects on your slate. Is there a fluidity when you start developing a project in one, perhaps as a film that you decide to make it a TV project because you think it'll work better that way or vice versa? Are, are there any examples you can cite in, in, in that realm? Does that happen quite pre more regularly now than it used to, or? Yeah, I think like conversion is a bit of a buzzword. We, I think we've all got scripts that, have been, that we started out with as movies that you convert to television. In fact, I've got one that I'm doing with the very lovely Tim Bevan down there. We've got yeah. uh, some Jackie Collins books that we bought together originally to do as a trilogy of movies that we're now, uh, we sort of saw the light and, and, and saw that we could explore them much better and more fully if we did it as a TV series. So that's, um, that's in progress. Yeah, actually well, certainly. And actually, we just bought a book recently, which we thought we were going to buy for TV, but actually in creative conversations, it feels much more like a movie. So it's, yeah, it's the, the, it's great. It's, it makes the job more exciting, this fluidity. We, um, we had a, I won't name the project, but we had a script come in and it was like 220 pages for a film. And we're like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> feels like a mini series. <laughs> My works in a different way. Yeah. 
Well, um, we're nearly out of time. And so I just want to uh, take this opportunity to say thank you very much to my three uh, esteemed speakers, Tim Bevan, Alison Owen, and Ian Canning. It's been great to have your insights uh, and experiences shared today with the, with the audience. Um, and thank you very much to the audience for your fantastic questions. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get through all of them, but uh, they were uh, very good. And uh, um, thought it was a great conversation. So very much appreciate your, your, uh, your sharing these insights with us and wish you all a great day. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Bye thank for you. now. Thanks. Thank you.